Hi everyone, this is Dr. Chantel Marshall here once again to teach you a new statistical test. Today we will be discussing the chi-square for goodness of fit. Keep in mind there are two chi-square tests. They are slightly different, so we're going to go over them one by one. What this lecture will cover is first parametric versus non-parametric tests. We have up until this point been conducting parametric tests, and this is the only non-parametric test that we will do in this class, the two chi-square tests. In addition, I'll show you how it is that you can convert data from something that you would use in a parametric test to something you could use in a non-parametric test. Then we'll go into the chi-square test for goodness of fit. One of the important things that you'll need to learn is how to determine the null hypothesis. Will you be using equal proportions or specific proportions? We'll go into the difference and how you know when to use which one. Then I'll show you some hypothesis testing with chi-square, how to set it all up, and of course you'll get some example problems so that you can learn how to do it on your own. I have a picture here of two different kinds of apples. And the reason is I want you to keep this in mind. For a chi-square test, we're not looking at means or standard deviations or variance. We're simply looking at counts. So if I had the question, do I have more green apples or red apples? You might be able to say, well, I can see that there are more green apples. But as you know, in statistics, we're not interested in just the mere difference but whether or not that difference is significant. So do I have a significantly different number of green apples than red apples? But we're only dealing with counts. Here, I have one. Here, I have four, if you count the one sort of hidden in the back. I don't have a way to compute means, I don't have a way to compute standard deviation, and I don't have a way to compute variance. So we have to use something different for these kinds of questions. So what are non-parametric tests? Let's start with parametric tests since that's actually what you've been doing. These are based on scores that are on an interval or ratio scale. In other words, you get lots and lots of scores from various people and then you do something with those scores. You use statistics such as the mean of your sample, the standard deviation of your sample, or the variance of your sample to infer the parameters of a larger population. This is what makes it parametric. So we're taking lots and lots of scores and then computing certain numbers from those scores so that they can tell us something about the population. With non-parametric tests, we're not moving from statistics to parameters. We're looking at frequencies instead of individual scores. So just like in the last slide I talked about, being able to count, I have a certain number of red apples and a certain number of green apples, and I'm trying to figure out if those two frequencies are significantly different from one another. So usually this is used for nominal data, categorical data. Green and red apples are not numerically different from one another. There are different categories, and I have a different frequency for each of those categories. Here, we're not uh, making inferences about parameters, such as mean, standard deviation, or variance of a population. I'm trying to figure out what the frequencies might be in the population. So just the number of people who are in a certain category, the number of red apples, the number of green apples that occurs in the population. Sometimes in our analyses, we'll convert scores that came from an interval or ratio scale into frequencies. This is actually really helpful if you have a bimodal distribution where some people tend to congregate near the low end of the scale and some people tend to congregate near the high end of the scale. 
For example, if I asked a certain number of people, how many apples have you eaten in the last month? I might get data that look like this on the left. So a lot of people didn't eat any apples. Some people ate one apple last month, some two, and some three. So it looks like I have a mode here of about one. But then I get seven people who ate 10 apples. Maybe they're all starting a new apple diet. But here I have two distinct modes, one at one apple and then one at 10 apples. So because this is kind of bimodal and a little bit weird data, we might choose to simply create two categories out of these apple eaters. One group we would call the low eaters. So they're the people who have eaten lower than five or fewer than five apples in the last month. We have 19 of those people. So we just took these people here, added them all up to create a frequency. We have 19 people who don't eat apples very often. But then we have this group over here that tends to really like apples and we're gonna label them the high eaters. So they have eaten five or more apples in the last month and we have seven of those. So now we have two categories, low and high apple eaters, as opposed to something on an interval, interval or ratio scale, which would give us a mean standard deviation and measure of variance. Okay, so what can we do with these kinds of data? You'll notice these are nominal scales. So this kind of test allows us to ask questions about nominal scales that we really couldn't answer with any of the parametric tests that we were conducting before. So we can attempt to answer questions like, does the grocery store sell significantly more green apples or red apples? So here we have two categories, green apples and red apples, and we have a frequency of how many are sold. Are there significantly more women than men at Nevada State College? So here we are looking to see if these numbers are unequal, and are they so unequal that we would say that there are significantly more women than men? And maybe a question like this, are there significantly more Democrats in California than the US generally? So here we're comparing something about a very specific group of people, people in California, to a larger population, in this case, the United States. And so a chi-square test allows us to ask and more importantly, answer these questions. And you'll notice that I've underlined the word significantly we're not interested in whether these numbers are unequal. We'll most likely get unequal numbers, but if they're so unequal that it seems like there's something else going on than simple differences in, um, small differences between these groups. So in order to answer these kinds of questions, we need to use a chi-square test that kind of fancy looking X is a Greek letter, chi. I know it looks like it should be pronounced chi, but it is pronounced chi. And we're going to square a lot of numbers and we're never going to take their square root in this case. So it remains a squared number, which is why we call it a chi square. You'll see when we do the math. What we're looking at as our dependent variable are frequencies, simple counts of how many people belong to a certain category or another, how many items belong to a certain category or other. One of the things that I want you to pay attention to is that we can compare what we have in these questions to some possibility. So for example, Question two, are there significantly more women than men at NSC? Well, all things being equal, we would expect that there would be the same amount of women and men at NSC. So any numbers that we collect, we would just want to compare to 
We do that a lot. In the second question though, or sorry, in this third question, are there significantly more Democrats in California than the US generally? So now we're looking at something about one state, California, and instead of simply comparing it to a 50-50, we're gonna compare it to some known population. We know how many Democrats are registered in the US. So we're always making a comparison to some possibility. For the goodness of fit test, we're looking at whether our sample pr proportions are comparable to our population proportions. So is there a difference between our sample and what we might expect from the population? As you can imagine, this includes um, our, or this is what makes up our null hypothesis. Is our sample different than what we would expect in the population if there's no difference? So for example, we would expect that in our population of the US, we would have equal numbers of men and women. And so we should expect the same at NSC if our null is true that there's no difference in gender at this school. So sometimes we use equal proportions. This means that all of your groups have the same number of frequencies. So your sample is distributed evenly among all of the options. Sometimes though, we, we use specific proportions and these are based on existing proportions we already know about. For example, we know how many people are registered Democrats and registered Republicans in the US. So we're gonna compare those in California to the US generally, which has a specific and existing proportion we can already use. Let's talk more about this chi-square for goodness of fit. We are using frequencies, 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 frequencies. So we'll use a curved F to represent frequencies, just like we have in our frequency tables, except we have a couple of different kinds. We have an observed frequency. This is your data. This is the number in a particular category, the actual count that you collected. We're going to give it a small O to designate that this is the number we actually observed ourselves. We're going to compare that number that we observed to what we expect if the null hypothesis is true, if there's no difference. So we're going to give that frequency a little e to denote that this is our expected value if the null hypothesis is true. Just like other hypothesis tests, we're trying to see if our data are so different that it can't just be due to sampling error or error in the way that we counted or some other small random difference. So if we are basing our expected frequencies on equal proportions, we are assuming that the expected frequencies are simply equally distributed among all of the groups. We might have two groups, in which case it's 50-50. We might have three groups where one third should go in each group. We might have four groups where one quarter will go into each group and so on. We might also base our expected frequency on the population proportions that we are given. And we'll come back to this. I'm going to set up a hypothesis test using equal proportions to show you how it's done. And then we'll go back and look at specific proportions to see the small change you'll need to make if you are given specific proportions. So let's go over an example. You ask 150 people if they prefer classes in the morning, afternoon, or evening. Let's say we're trying to figure out at what times we should be adding courses to our schedule. Now we expect that people will be equally likely to choose morning 
as afternoon as evening. The null hypothesis is that there's no difference in our preference. So what does this mean for the actual observed, sorry, what does this mean for the actual expected frequency when we get into the math? Our calculation for our expected frequency is simply p times n. I apologize in advance. I know we have been using p to mean probability of error. Here, p is proportion. Proportion. Because we have three categories, students can either choose morning or afternoon or evening. They can't choose more than one. We're assuming that students will fall into them equally. So our proportion here for each category is one third of our students. And because we have 150 of, student, of our students, we expect that each time we'll have 50 students. That's our expected frequency. So once again, we're simply taking our proportion. In this case, it's an equal proportion based on having three different categories. And then we multiply that by our sample size, in this case, 150. Here, it gives us a nice round number of 50. But I do want you to take note that your expected frequencies can be decimals. Sometimes that's just the way that the math works out. Then you want to compare that to your observed frequency. So we ask all of the 150 people, would you prefer a morning class, an afternoon class, or an evening class? And we get these numbers. So 65 people preferred morning, 45 people preferred afternoon, and 40 people preferred evening. Okay, so does that pattern differ from what we expected of 50? This is where we have to start figuring out using math. But before we get into that, let's take a step back to look at our hypotheses. I already said a little bit about them. Our null hypothesis was that we wouldn't find a difference between the morning, afternoon, and evening courses. So I'm gonna give you a template that you can follow. You don't necessarily have to follow it precisely or perfectly. You just wanna get the idea across of your null and your alternative. So your null hypothesis is just like before, there's no difference. There is no difference in the distribution of your variable between your groups. So the distribution of X, the distribution of preference for class, does not differ between morning, afternoon, and evening. Your alternative is that there is a difference in the distribution of X or distribution of your variable between the groups. You'll notice that I'm not going to give you a statistical notation for your null and alternative hypotheses. We're not going to use those for the chi-square. We'll always be writing them out. Let's use the example of class preference time to write some hypotheses. You'll notice these are not perfectly matched to the template, but they do give you the idea of what should be happening for the null and the alternative. So our null hypothesis is that there is no difference in preference for morning, afternoon, or evening classes. This is pretty straightforward and gets across the basic point of the null hypothesis. That means that our alternative is that there is a difference in preference for morning, afternoon, or evening classes. Now one thing that you may have noticed is that there are no tails. I don't claim here which group might be higher or lower. In this case, you kind of want to think about it like an ANOVA, in which we simply were hypothesizing that there would be a significant difference somewhere or there wouldn't be and all of the means were equal. This is not the only thing that the chi-square has in common with our ANOVA. In fact, finding the critical region is similar as well. So we're going to find the critical region, in other words, the region in which the chi-square we calculate 
allows us to reject our null hypothesis using our degrees of freedom. And we're going to calculate that using C minus one, where C is the number of categories you have. You can also think about it as the number of columns that you have. And as always, alpha. As always, alpha stands for the proportion in the tail, the likelihood of a type one error if you do happen to reject the null hypothesis. So like I said, for our null and alternative hypotheses, we didn't have tails. We didn't have a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. We simply had there is no difference or there is a difference. And that's because the chi-square distribution is positively skewed. There are no negative values. So it looks something like this. So remember, this is a theoretical distribution. If we took all frequencies of a certain number of categories with certain uh, alphas, we would have this kind of distribution. So most would fall sort of below this line. We're going to use the critical region out here in the tail. So this is much like the F distribution for ANOVA, just the one way simple ANOVA that we've calculated in this class. All right, so once you've set up your null and alternative hypothesis and you have calculated your degrees of freedom and you have settled on a specific alpha, you're going to use your chi distribution to figure out what your critical chi-square is. So what is the line at which you are willing to reject your null hypothesis? Remember that we're going to shade in the small part and we want our chi-square to fall into this shaded region. Here is a small version of the chi-square distribution. You have this in your textbook. And just like before, we'll be using an alpha of either 0.05 or 0.01. We won't be using the others. And because in this class we'll be focusing on chi-squares for groups, for four groups or fewer, we'll really only be using the top of the table because our degrees of freedom can't go above three. So you'll mostly be working within this uh, area here. So if we are going to run a hypothesis test looking at our preference for class time, and we know that we have three groups or three categories. So C minus one is two. And let's use an alpha of 0.05 since that's the norm. And that gives us a chi-square critical of 5.99. So our line here is 5.99. And we can reject our null if we get anything above that number. So how do we actually calculate what that number is? Here is our formula for calculating our chi-square. So let's break this down. Here we have our observed frequency. That's the actual count. Then we have our expected frequency, which we based on the null hypothesis, in a couple of different places both on the top of this formula and again on the bottom. Remember I said that the chi-square squares a lot of numbers and we never get rid of it. So that's here. You'll notice that there is no square root at any point in this formula. That's why it's called a chi-square. And finally, the most important part to keep in mind as you're calculating is sigma which you all know means sum. That means that for each of your categories, you must do this calculation and then you add them all at the end. So for each category, you take the observed frequency, 
and subtract the expected frequency. Once you have that number, you square it. And then once you have that value, you divide it by your expected frequency. For our example, we have three categories. So we're going to do this three times and then add up the results at the end. This takes organization. You want to make sure that you're keeping track of all the categories and doing all of the necessary work. When you only have two or three categories, this table that I'm about to show you might seem a little much. But when we get into the chi-square test for independence, this table becomes really useful. So I would suggest that you get into the habit of figuring out whatever organization it is that works for you. So let's say that you ask 150 people, once again, what kinds of class times they prefer. You expect that they will be liked equally. So here is the table that I like to make when I am calculating my chi-square. So first, I label all of my categories. Sometimes you only have two, sometimes you have three. As we move on, we might get four or even more when we get to the test of independence. Then I make sure to fill out my observed frequencies. This is the actual number that I calculate, as well as my expected frequencies. These again are based on my null hypothesis in which I said that the uh, that the students will like the classes equally. One thing you can do to check your math is make sure that both of these counts add up to your sample size. In our case, we asked 150 people. So our observed should clearly add up to 150 because we asked each of them what kind of class they prefer. Our expected frequency should also add up to the same number. If they don't, go back and make sure that you've done your calculations correctly. Then I have one column for each step of the process. Here, I have to subtract my expected frequency from my observed, so this number from this number, and then I square whatever I got here, and then here, I simply take this number I got here and divide it by my expected frequency. Once I have done that for each category, I then go ahead and add those all up, and this number here, ends up being my chi-square value. Once you have added them, you are done calculating your chi-square. So let's take our example. I'm going to fill in the various numbers that we calculated and collected. So the first thing that we did is we calculated our expected frequencies. For each group, we expected 50 students to like that particular time. This is our expectation if the null is true, if there is no difference in preference. But we did get some differences as we saw in the observed values. So 65 people liked morning, 45 liked afternoon, and 40 liked evening. So now we're going to figure out if this distribution is significantly different from this distribution so that we can say that there is a preference for a certain class time. So all I'm going to do is do the math all the way across. So 65 minus 50 is 15, 45 minus 50 is negative 5, and 40 minus 50 is negative 10. It's okay to have negative numbers here because we're going to get rid of them in this step here, where we square those numbers. So 15 squared is 225, negative 5 squared is positive 25, and negative 10 squared is positive 100. Remember, when you multiply a negative times a negative, you're going to get a positive number. Finally, we take each of these values here and divide it by its own expected frequency. I want you to get in the habit of looking over here and dividing, because sometimes these numbers are not the same, and you want to make sure that you're dividing by the correct number. So you're going to divide this 225 by your expected frequency for us, that's 50. So 225 divided by 50, then 25 divided by 50, then 100 divided by 50. So 225 divided by 50 is 
then we have 0.5, and finally we have 2. I will say that these numbers are nice and round, but when you calculate a chi-square, they're not always this nice. This just helps you understand the math before you get into it yourself. Finally, we add up all of those numbers on that right-hand column, and that gives us our chi-square. In our case, we have a perfect 7. I've gone out to three decimals just to remind you that you should be going out to three decimals when you calculate. Okay, so now that you've learned how to do the math, let's quickly go over all of the hypothesis testing steps, and then let's use this example. So step one is you state your hypotheses. If you have equal proportions, you're going to use that template that I gave you. There's no difference in the distribution of X between groups. Your alternative is that there is a, there is a difference in the distribution of X between the groups. Step two, you're going to define the critical region using your degrees of freedom and the alpha. Step three, you're going to calculate your chi-square, which we've just learned how to do. And in step four, you're going to reject or fail to reject your null hypothesis. State the p-value. Is the p-value low? So you should be rejecting. If it is not low, you should be failing to reject. So let's use the example of class time. So I'm going to simply copy over my hypotheses that we came up with before. Our null is that there's no difference in preference, and our alternative is that there is a difference in preference. Step two, we decided that the critical chi-square value was a 5.99. Anything above this, anything in that critical region, and we can reject our null hypothesis. In step three, we calculated our chi-square to be a perfect seven. And in step four, that means we should reject our null hypothesis and state that our p-value is less than 0.05. In other words, we're rejecting our null hypothesis, which makes our probability of committing a type one error less than 0.05, which is acceptable. If we want to put this in everyday language, we would simply say, Students prefer morning classes. Since they liked morning classes more than we would have expected and did not like evening and afternoon classes as much as we would have expected. So that's it. Four step hypothesis testing like we've been doing. Now I told you we would come back to specific proportions. This is a slight variation of what we just did. So I don't want you to think that these are very different. It's just a matter of setting up your null hypothesis as well as your expected frequencies, since those are basically the same thing. So let's say that you're interested in whether women are more likely to major in English than men here at Nevada State College. So you recruit 20 English majors. Now, I want you to keep in mind here that major is not a variable. It is not varying. Everyone is an English major. There's no difference in majors. So this is not a variable. This is remaining constant. What is a variable is gender. So let's say that you recruit these 20 English majors and you find that 14 of them are women and six of them are men. And you say, wow, that's a lot more women than men. I think it's the case that women like to be English majors more than men do. But wait, there's something important that we have to keep in mind. What if NSC in general has more women on its campus? What if NSC is in fact 75% women? We have to take that into account when we set up what we expect to find within these 20 English majors. So just like before, we are going to use our formula for our expected frequency, which is proportion times our sample size. But in this case, we have to use a specific proportion, something that we are given, like the fact that NSC is 75% women. 
So in this case, we're going to use a specific proportion of the population. If we know that NSC is 75% women and 25% men, we have to use those in order to calculate our expected frequencies. So for women, our expected frequency must use the proportion of 0.75. And then we multiply that by our sample size, which is 20, and that gives us an expected frequency of 15. So given that NSC is 75% women, any 20 students that we run into, we would actually expect 15 of them to be women. That means that our expected frequency for men is the rest. So 0.25, that's their proportion, times our sample size, in this case 20, so we expect 5. Now those numbers that we were given, 14 women and 6 men, don't look very different from what we would expect to find if we just ran into any 20 students on campus. So if you are given a specific proportion in the form of percentages usually, then you know that you have to use a specific proportion and not simply assume that your null hypothesis is that everything is going to be equal. So here I'm going to give you the setup for the math on a specific proportions chi-square. You'll notice that I only have two categories, in this case women and men, because everyone was an English major. I don't have to put that anywhere. I counted 14 women English majors and 6 men, which gave me a total of 20. My expected frequencies based on my specific proportions were 15 women and 5 men, and again that adds up to 20. When I go ahead and subtract my expected frequency from my observed, I get negative 1 for women and positive 1 for men, but when you square both of those you get 1. Now I've left this last box empty. I want you to go ahead and do the math. What you need to do is divide this number by your expected frequency. So you should get two different numbers here, add that up, and that is the chi-square for this particular test. So what does that mean for our hypotheses? They're slightly different. Here we want to make sure that we are comparing our sample to some specific population. So the template looks something like this. The distribution of x in our sample is the same as some population. What are we comparing it to? Next, our alternative is that it is not the same. So once again, we don't have to worry about one-tailed or two-tailed because chi-squares are all positive. So in this case, we're simply saying that the distribution of x, the distribution of our variable in the sample, is not the same as some population that we know about, that we have specific proportions for. So let's take our example of English majors and come up with some hypotheses. So our null hypothesis would be that the distribution of men and women among English majors, since that's who we're interested in, is the same as the NSC population. So here we're making sure that we're taking into account the NSC population specific proportions when we come up with what the English majors would look like if our null hypothesis is true. They should look the same. But our alternative is that they're not the same. So the distribution of men and women among English majors is not the same as the NSC population. So whether we're using equal proportions or specific proportions, we're always making sure that we're comparing it to something if the null is true. But sometimes if the null is true, we still have wonky proportions, and so we need to take those into account. So I went ahead and did the math for our men and women. You can if you would like to. I just wanted to put it into a hypothesis test. 
So first I'll give you the basic setup and then we'll fill it in with what we have for our English majors. So our hypotheses, once again, are these basic templates, the distribution of some variable and the sample is the same as some population. Our alternative is that the distribution of that, of that variable in the sample is not the same as some population. There is a difference in these distributions. Step two, same as before, we're going to define our critical region. We use our formula for degrees of freedom, C minus one, and we use alpha. This step is not different. Then we calculate our chi-square. So instead of using equal proportions where we might say we expect 10 women and 10 men, we use those numbers we came up with, 15 women and five men, to calculate our chi-square. In step four, once again, we reject or fail to reject our null hypothesis and we state the p-value. So I'm going to copy over our step one that we came up with before. These are our null and alternative hypotheses. Step two is to define the critical region. So if you go back to your distribution and we use a degree of freedom of one, since we have two categories, subtract one is one, and then alpha of 0.05, we get a critical value of 3.84. When we go to calculate our chi-square, we don't get a very big number. So our calculation reaches a 0.267. You can check your own math to make sure this is what you get. In step four, we always reject or fail to reject. In this case, we don't have a high enough chi-square to fall into our critical region. And so we fail to reject our null hypothesis and our p-value is greater than 0.05. The probability that we simply got these numbers due to error or chance is larger than 0.05. It has nothing to do with English majors attracting more women than men. So you might say in everyday language that men and women major in English at the same rate. So that's it for hypothesis testing for goodness of fit. Some reminders as you go on to practice on your own. We use frequencies or counts. There are no means, no standard deviations, and no variance. This is because we are using categorical data, nominal data, where we can't calculate those kinds of things. Because we cannot analyze those, we're forced to use a non-parametric test, the chi-square. You are comparing your observed frequencies, what you actually count, to expected frequencies. And those expected frequencies are always based on the null hypothesis. That null hypothesis changes depending on whether you're using equal or specific proportions. A big hint that you should be using specific proportions is if you are given a percentage within the problem you are given. If you are given population percentages, those are your specific proportions that you should be using. If you're not, then your best guess is that they're all equal, that there's no difference at all. Keep in mind that your expected frequencies can be decimals. Your observed frequencies are always whole numbers. You can't have 0.5 of a person preferring morning classes, but your expected frequencies can sometimes have decimals. It just happens to be how the math works out. And we're going to use the same four step hypothesis testing that we used for our parametric tests. You state your null and alternative hypotheses. You define your critical region. You calculate your chi-square to see if it falls in your critical region. And then you reject or fail to reject your null hypothesis. And then you report your p-value. So I hope that the chi-square test 
shows you that we can do something with categorical data, not just create frequency tables or frequency graphs, but actually analyze those numbers to see if we have some significant and meaningful differences between categories.